Thank you very much, Professor Prescott, Dr. Brokaw, Dr. Tosh, Artistic Director Michelle Terry, previous speakers, and to you all. What can Shakespeare do in an age of climate emergency? My name is Elise de Roy and I stand today on Ghana land and as is protocol here, Ghana Mayuna, Ghana Yadana, Ghana Tempinthi, I acknowledge and pay respect to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of this land and to elders past, present and emerging. Now Shakespeare has of course a long history of being associated with land and landscape and we see this in books and performances, merchandise, Shakespeare gardens, a long tradition of outdoor theater that continues to this day the world over. And this is largely driven by the text's uh, own references to say flowers or trees or oceans that tends to be looked at individually or thematically, as well as plays grouped as the so-called nature plays or pastoral plays, or to use Northup Fry's, uh, examination, the green world plays, all providing fertile ground for eco-theatrical interpretations. Eco-theatre is not only interested in making production more sustainable and ideally regenerative, but also challenging the way we think about nature as other than us and exploring so-called nature from a non-anthropocentric, i.e. non-human centered focus, as well as looking at uh, intersectional ideas of race, justice, and access to resources as symptomatic of a way of thinking that's also responsible for environmental destruction. So eco-theater places nature and culture together rather than nature as something other than us, outside of us, and therefore humans feeling that we are superior to other living forms. So let's go back earlier though, let's go back to um, before eco-theater, before theater, to the theater of the living globe. And I'd like you to imagine what the earth looked like 4.2 billion years ago. What did the landscapes of the earth uh, look like and, and feel like at that time? Moving forward to about 5.5 million years ago, when we start to see early uh, humans, proto hominids, emerge to 195,000 years ago as we see Homo sapiens, our own species, come on the scene. And where in this vast time scale do we see an industrialized, urbanized landscape? It's in this final speck, isn't it? It's a very short period of time. Now, biophilia is a hypothesis developed by evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson to suggest that our minds and bodies continue to respond to environmental stimuli as present in that ancestral environment. So there are certain biophilic cues which we are attracted to and others which we are repelled by. Now, this is, of course, mediated by individual experience and culture, but overwhelmingly it creates um, a desire to engage with life and lifelike processes. And there's over 30 years of research into biophilic effects, particularly in the built environment. So interestingly, this isn't just about being outdoors, this is about how we can create uh, indoor spaces and representations of the environment. So what might a biophilic building look like? Well, this is what I think is a really good example of a biophilic building. It's one with direct exposure to say weather and light, as well as indirect natural cues. For instance, paintings of animals, stars, clouds, as you can see in the beautiful picture behind me of the Sam Wanamaker ceiling candlelight, organic materials, and also symbolic experiences of the natural world. So those shapes and forms and patterns that echo living beings and living processes. But what might a biophilic text look like? We know that biophilic buildings and biophilic spaces have this impact on us psychophysiologically. Um, but might it be conceivable that a text that's filled with these elements might also have a really strong effective pull on us? It might make us attracted to that text and want to engage with it. And if so, what would that text have within it? Well, I would suggest it's very similar to that for biophilic landscape. It would have flowers as in the material landscape, trees, 
bodies of water, weather events and storms and earthquakes and hurricanes and all the rest of it, insects, animals, in fact, numerous living beings, and ecological processes but also other elements of the living landscape. So, you know, stars and anything you might be able to think of, I'd encourage you to start to brainstorm these ideas and think about where you might have seen them in certain plays that shall remain nameless. Everything from snail shells to rainbows, to herbs, to the arc of the sky, to landscape topographies and springs and rivers. In essence, a textual ecosystem. So this is about looking at works, Shakespeare's work, not in terms of individual themes, but looking at it in terms of the way that these all knit together. And you know, the dynamic processes, the movement within the text, the transitions between diurnal and seasonal and meteorological changes, the connections, because a, a material landscape is never static, it's always in a state of flux. And that's what we respond to psychophysiologically, that's what we want to engage with. Now, this landscape might be biophilic, yes, harmonious but also biophobic. And this is really important because just like the ancestral environment, the environment is a place of risk, of peril, and this gives us drama, this gives us the sublime. We, as opposed to ecophobic landscapes, to borrow Simon Estock's term, in which there's overly uh, mechanized, industrialized, say chemicalized processes, creating sterile environments devoid of life. So we know that Shakespeare's text and if you Google the term, how Shakespeare tempests the brain, there's some fascinating work done on this. We know that his text, his rhythm, his rhyme creates an exploratory terrain in our minds where we don't know what's going to happen next. And that creates a sense of anticipation and surprise and engagement. And in essence, it creates an internal theater, an internal globe. So I wonder whether these biophilic and biophobic references might add to this sense of engagement and what that says about our own place within our own living globe. So over the past three years, I've been examining all of Shakespeare's plays and I found over, and to be very conservative, 17,000 biophilic and biophobic references in the text. Now, this is not about authorial intent. I'm not suggesting that in 1590, uh, Shakespeare sat down and was like, you know what, I'm really digging this biophilia thing. It's really vibrant at the moment. I'm gonna make that my, own, my angle, you know, chuck it in all the plays. Of course not. I'm saying that if we take a presentist look at the works from today's perspective and we analyze them as an artifact, we find these references there. Now, what do we do with them? Well, I would, I would um, perhaps suggest that it will give us a new way to look at the plays and also change the way in which we consider nature within the plays because what's really fascinating is that these references, and this was quite a surprise to me, I did not expect this at all, they're pretty evenly spread across all the works. Now, some are more biophilic and some are more biophobic, uh, depending on the theme of the play. For example, um, Henry VI, um, part two, very biophobic. Um, Titus Andronicus, also biophilic. Anyway, there's an incredible blend and it creates this symphony of light and shade, which we I don't feel we've adequately explored. And it also uh, brings into question how we can harness this through eco-dramaturgy, namely how we interpret the plays and eco scenography how we stage them, to quote Tanya B. And I'm putting together a framework now as a formula for re-enchantment, as E.O. Wilson calls it. So I would encourage you to pick up any Shakespeare play, any passage, have a read of it, the shapes, forms, colors, textures, living beings, biophilic and biophobic components, and consider how this means we can more meaningfully engage with our own living landscapes, our own living globes, and in doing so, hopefully engender a greater desire to protect it. Thank you so much for listening.